going to actually start the recording now for this as we got going. So we started with, here's this graph, and we're making comparisons. And when doing comparisons, I like probably briefly glazed over this one of the first days that we looked at graphs. Um, but there's like four ideas that you're going to talk about every time you're talking about comparing. Um, you can do more, but it's shape, center, spread, and outliers. What shapes do we have when we're comparing them? What centers do we have when we're comparing them? Shape, center, what spreads do we have? And then what outliers do we have? So the initial argument that was discussed was looking at and saying, the 50th percentile survived is right here. So half of those that survived are above that weight, whereas 75% of those who have died are below that weight, in indicating that this weight, there's a higher probability that you will die if you're at that weight than if you have that weight, you'll have a 50% chance of survival based on this set of data. The second idea was looking at and saying survived will be have a range. So range, when we're talking about box plots, we're going to talk about maximum minus, minus minimum. So if you say range, you need to back it up with some calculations and a number so that I know that you know what you're talking about. So if you say range, you would, you know, and it wouldn't be a bad idea to even throw on there like a little approximation, right? It looks like that maximum is about, and again, you can approximate 3.6, maybe. I don't know. The minimum appears to be about 0.1 or 0.2. or sorry, 1.1, we're at 1, 1.1 or 1.2. So the range, maximum minus minimum, 2.5. Maximum minus minimum, my range is about 2.5. And then you look at the other one and find the range of the other one. What was the range of the other one? So the other one about 2.7, 1 to 2.7 for a range of 2. Point, or sorry, of 1.7. So you can clearly see that 2.5 is greater than 1.7. So the range of the survived is more than the died. And you might be saying to yourself, but self, like you can clearly see it. Well, yes, you might be able to clearly see it. But again, I cannot read minds. So when I'm asking you to compare graphs, you need to be writing down how you're getting to these conclusions. Just making a blanket statement that says this is more than that. I'm like, well, based on what? All right. Some of you in your best, gra like, pros and cons of a graph that you wrote about and then you uh, replied to other people's comments, some of you said that the box plot is the easiest one to understand. And I want to know why you believe it's the easiest one to understand. Because I would actually argue box plot is one of the harder ones to understand if you've never been taught a box plot. The reason why is what I see is people would look at this graph and say, well, this is the longest, so it must have the most amount of data in it, which would be a wrong analysis. Because you all know, because you've been taught this already, 25% of the data is on that whisker, 25% of the data is in this part of the box, 25% is in that part of the box, and then 25% is in that part of the box. So this part of the box is the most condensed because it's the narrowest, so that 25% of the data is the most closely grouped, all right? But back to comparing. Shape. Do we have an approximate shape for this? Is it very clearly skewed? Does not look like it to me. Does it appear that the median is about in the middle of the box? It does. So I would say because the median is approximately in the middle and there's no clear skew, it appears to be roughly symmetric. Those that survived seem to be roughly symmetric as you move your way across. This plot, it appears that the narrowest one is the lower quartile. This one is slightly longer, but then the upper 50% has a much longer spread than the lower. So it would be mildly skewed to the right. So in comparing the medians, the median for those that survived, well, we already said when we first talked about this, is about the same as the third quartile of those that died, which is about 2.1 or 2.2, which is larger than the median of this one, 
which we see is about 1.6 or maybe 1.7. When doing comparisons, if this were a test-like question, yes, writing on the little diagram that's there, showing and pointing to things, giving it values, and then that helps to support your discussion when you're doing your comparison. So we've talked about shapes, we've talked about centers, we've talked about spreads. Do either graphs demonstrate any outliers or outlier behavior? The answer in this case we know is no because there's no asterisk values up here. There's no asterisk values down here on either of the graphs. All right. If you had to, you would then do calculations to verify that, where I'd take the interquartile range. Oh, and we talked about ranges when we talked about overall spread. You could also look at just these. Does this box appear to be about the same width as that box? Yeah, they're pretty close. So you could add that even though the range of the survived is more than those that died, the middle 50% appear to have a closer range than the overall range of the data set. It would be like a little bonus added piece in terms of showing that you understand more than just the range because the interquartile range tells you that middle 50%. All right. Does having a lower birth rate cause a higher likelihood of death? This is a good follow-up question. Does having a lower birth weight result in having a higher cause of death? So because there is no designed experiment, we can say that there is no causation in this case. We're seeing what's called an association. Does there appear to be something related to birth weight and survival and death? Yes. Can we say for sure that's what it is? No, we cannot. We would have to do a designed experiment where we in, would intentionally somehow cause a low birth weight create that and see if that then resulted in death. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean, hopefully, we're not working with people because that would be illegal. Lots of things would be violated in that process. Ethics, huge problems. But looking at this and seeing data, to the general population and public, they would often look at this and say, well, yes, of course, if you have a lower birth rate, it's going to cause a higher likelihood of, be, uh, of dying. All right. Because they're not understanding, which you need to understand, that the only way we can prove causation is through a designed experiment. Uh, better yet, a well-designed experiment is even better than just a designed experiment. All right. Um, uh, we've briefly touched on biases. Just going to go over these quickly again, just as a review. Response bias is code for somehow the respondent does something that creates a bias. Most commonly, they lie. This is why exit polls are really hard, because whatever the current cultural expectation is in some region, they come out like, hey, how did you vote? They're like, uh, I voted. If you're in Shasta County, the answer is Republican, of course, because that's what Shasta County is, one of the reddest counties in the state of California. So if you don't want to be looked at and condescended upon when you leave, you answer whether or not you did or not. Well, I, I voted Republican. Of course I did. All right. That's our response bias. People lie. Can you do anything to really prevent that? Usually not. Not well anyways. Because if people are going to lie, they're going to lie. Over and under sampling bias. This got back to that example we did in class, the Dewey Truman. They oversampled people who were in the same uh, political party as Dewey. And therefore said that Dewey won in a landslide. Whereas it was actually Truman. Wording bias, you say things in such a way that it encourages a response or, and I've seen this a lot, you read questions or surveys and you read it and then you reread it and you're like, I don't even know what they're asking me for. You know, they throw in maybe a couple double negatives and a responsive yes means you're actually opposing to it. I mean, there's certain ways that you can do that. So having a well-worded uh, and then non-response bias. And the, again, here's, there's nothing you can do about non-response bias. You send out a survey in the mail, you send out some new phone calls, robocalls, you get them, pick them up, and people who don't respond, you don't know what they think. And that is a type of bias. All right? You can probably look at this. How many of you, just by show of hands, ever rely upon a Yelp score? Nobody? Wow. How about you go out, you're like looking for a place to eat, and you look at how many stars they have, you're like, oh, I'm only going to pick something that's got at least three and a half stars. Maybe a few of you do that. 
all of that is related to people who are willingly and desiring to write a review, which tend to be people who have a problem. The most vocal people tend to be the most negative people. Now, do you get some great responses? Absolutely, you do sometimes. Maybe you were encouraged to do it so that you could get a 5% off on your next visit or a 10% off on your next visit, which also encourages you to give them usually a good score. All right, so whether or not you actually believe those little star ratings when you're choosing a restaurant to go to, um, there's a lot of bias that goes into that because we're just asking for people's responses. And again, people who, who have a really bad experience are highly likely or higher likely they have a higher likelihood of doing a review. All right. So this gets us back to the binomial, which we just did the other day. So we're going to do this as a quick refresher. It should look familiar if you're doing your check your understanding problems because this was one of them. If it doesn't look familiar, then this is the internal dialogue in your head saying, yeah, I really should probably do some of those. So I know if this were a test-like question, I could really crank this out quick and easy. But what we have here going on is, and I know it's a binomial because the probability of the standard is win, so there's going to be win or lose. All right. And again, typically the question would start with, is this or what type of a distribution is this? So then you have to know, okay, is this going to be a binomial? Is it going to be a geometric? Will it be a hypergeometric or will it be a Poisson, the four that we're going to talk about today? All right. Well, it's win or lose. That means there's only two outcomes, so it could be several of them. The likelihood that they will win on any given game is this. So that means my probability is constant. There is a 13-year win history. Okay, so that's the basis for this. Upcoming monthly schedule has 12 games. So I have a set number of games. Set number of games means it's not geometric. Geometric was I go until I have my first success. So it's not geometric. And then I'm finding the expected number of wins. And things like that. So I'm counting how many wins in the next 12 games with a fixed winning percentage, and it's only win-loss. This is a binomial condition. All right, so the expected value, that requires me to remember my formula for expected value. Expected value of x for a binomial is n times p, which is 12 times 0.3694. That's a 4, that last number there. And then you just take that in, plug in your calculator, and tell you how many games you would expect to win in a upcoming 12-game set. Right. This, again, assumes that the probability of success is constant all the way throughout. Right. Second half, what's the probability that San Jose Sharks will win six games in the upcoming month? Oh, now I'm going to use the entire formula. So I'm going to remember what the formula is. Probability that x equals r for a binomial is n choose r, that's combination formula, times p, p is the probability of success, to the r power, times q, or 1 minus p, 1 minus p is q, I'll use them interchangeably, and q would be to the n minus r, so I'd plug in numbers, 12 choose 6, because it says probability that I will win 6 games, all right, times 0.3694 to the sixth power, times, and then I need to find one minus that value, and I'm running out of space on the side of my thing here, or on mine anyways, you can still see it, uh, 0.6306 raised to the 12 minus 6, so that's also going to be 6. Because it's only 12 games, the 6 and the 6 are going to be the same number. All right. Hindsight, now I probably should have picked some value where I said this is like 4. If this were 4, then that would be 4, and this number down here would be 8. But again, to remember what goes with what, this is successes, this is winning, I want 6 wins. This is the probability of losing. In this case, I want 6 losses. And then this comes from my calculator. So this falls in the category of I said, you don't need a graphing calculator, but it will be helpful. You can do this longhand with a regular calculator or even just by hand, NCR. Oh, and that blue is really an ugly color on red. What's a good color against red? Let's do black. 
NCR is equal to N factorial over N. Oh, now it's going to bleed into the black down there. N factorial over N minus R factorial times R factorial, which in our case will be 12 factorial, which is 12 times 11 times 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 over N minus R, which is 12 minus 6, so that will be 6 factorial times R, which is another 6 factorial. This 6 factorial will reduce with everything that's going to be back down here for the 6 minus all the way down. So you can eventually figure this one out by hand. All right. And if you have, and I'm not sure if a telephone, uh, which you can't use, by the way, on tests and quizzes, so you'd have to have some other type of a calculator. Um, but other calculators do have a factorial button, and you could get there. If you don't know how to do that, this is what Google's for. TI-80, whatever you have combinations. It'll show you a quick little video on how to do combinations. But anyways, we do this, plug these numbers in, and it will tell me then the single probability that I win exactly six games. So if I do this on my graphing calculator or with an online calculator for a binomial distribution, the likelihood of winning exactly six games in the next 12 will be probability that x equals six is 0.14763. How many decimals should we round to, Professor? I say don't. Don't round. Put five or six down. Don't round. Um, we're going to start using this for further probabilities as we go along. And if you start rounding early, we get very skewed or, or incorrect results as we go later. Some of you might be more in the science realm and you're thinking about significant figures because maybe your chemistry professor is talking about that. As statisticians, we honestly don't care about significant figures. Just write them all down. All right. And then lastly, what's probably the San Jose Shirts? Will it win at least five games? Probability X is greater than or equal to five. So that would mean I would have to calculate it for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. In which case, it's probably going to be shorter to do probability, or sorry, doo -doo, one minus the probability that they win four or fewer. Because then I'm only doing five calculations. Zero wins, one wins, two wins, three wins, and four wins. Add those up, subtract from one, and that will give me the likelihood they win five or more games. A little bit more work involved there, but more about the set it up. And then you'd be plugging in doing that combination formula multiple times. There are three men. So we're discussing in your groups, I said to try to map it out with a tree diagram. When I say tree diagram, that's what I'm talking about. So if you're thinking your way through that, the first choice, you're either going to pick a male or a female. And then here it'll be a male or a female. And then here will be male or female. Here it's going to be male or female, male or female, male or female, male or female. So this one ends up being three men. This is two men and one female. This is two men and one female. This is one male and two female. Here. Two men and one female. Two female and one man. Two female, one man. Three female. And I'm looking for what? Two men, Two men and one female. So it's going to be this one. Mm -hmm. This one. This one. And when I'm done, is that and or or? Is it this one and this one and this one? Or does it happen this way or this way or this way? It's actually or. Because I can either get two men by picking man, man, female. Or 
male, female, male, or female, male, male. Those are the three ways it could have happened. But this is the mapping, but this does not include the probability. So then I got to go in here and I got to do my probabilities. In the first place, what is the likelihood that I pick the male? I'm talking right here. What was the likelihood that I picked the male? Two sevenths, because there were seven people. So there's a two in seven chance I picked, because there's only two men. Four women. So this should be three sevenths. All right, so that's three sevenths. And then I'm going to go, so then down here, this would be four sevenths. But I can only be on one branch or the other. So let's assuming that I started and I went on this branch, and then I got to pick the second person. What's the likelihood that I pick a male? Two sixths. Because I've already picked one of the peoples, happened to be a man, so that probability changed. Likelihood of picking the female is three sixths, because all three females still exist in that branch, but it's down one person. And then lastly, on the third person selected, again, thinking I stay in this branch, two-sixths, and then I go to here. What's the likelihood of picking a male? One-fifth. And you might say, but I don't care about that branch. But again, I just want to get a sense for what we're doing in doing these conditional probabilities. They're conditional because they changed. They changed because it depended on what the previous thing was. Likelihood of picking a female... There's still all three females left, but there's five remaining. So this was two sixths. So then you can see sevenths, six fifths, three, two, one. And this is still, oh, sorry, four, not three. We've not had any females picked. So that should be four fifths. All right. Four fifths because seven i've already picked one person so there's six remaining i picked the second person and there's now only five remaining to choose from one of them is a male four of them are female in each step along the way looking at these two when it's an either or they add to one when i only get to the next step there's two men remaining out of six. Oh, this should be Again, I made a mistake, and I somehow managed to have a woman disappear. That's four. In this step, these two add to one. Why do they add to one? Because, again, I've already selected one out, but what's remaining is either a male or a female. And there's, you're in a, you have to choose one or the other, which means if you're not a male, you're a female. If you're not a female, you're a male. But they have to add to one in this case. These two have to add to one. Because, again, that's the last step in that process. So here I went three male. We chose a female, which there was a 4-6 chance of that happening. What's the likelihood of picking a male then on the last step? That's going to be two-fifths because one was already selected. This was a female, and then there's two men left. Female, that will be three-fifths. And you're getting a set, again, this is just kind of each step going along. The probabilities change with every step because they depend on what the previous selection was. But if I just look at this one and to find out how that one happened. So that one came off of this row. It happened as male, female, male. That was the selection process. And the probabilities were male, Three sevenths, female, four sixths, male, two fifths. So that would be three times four is 12 times two is 24 over uh, 210, 30 times seven. So the likelihood of getting two males and a female in this process, this method for this particular set of branches, 
pick the male, then the female, then the male. That's two males and a female. That happened 24 times out of 210. 210 because 6 times 5 is 30. 30 times 7 is 210. Multiplying probabilities. Because, again, it's, I get a male and a female and a male and, and, and. It's the multiplication principle. It's intersection. This one will be 3 sevenths times 2 sixths times 4 fifths. Or 3 times 2, which is 6. 6 times 4 is 24. Looking at the numerators. Which is also 24 210 tenths. And then down here, I didn't fill in the numbers. 4 sevenths. 3 sixths, because there wasn't a male yet picked. 2 sixths, because then that's the next male. Uh, two fifths. So it'd be four times three times two, which is 12 times two, which is 24. Seven times six times five, which is like the other. So they all end up being each individually 24 two hundred and tenths. But it can happen any one of those three ways. So the first way or the second way or the third way. So I'd add them all up. And that would be 96 two hundred and tenths. Two, four, six, oh, not 96. 72. 210 tenths. All right. And that's an example of a geometric distribution with only a few values. In your, check your understanding from your book, when doing a hypergeometric, hypergeometric, um, use an online tool. Go online and find one that does hypergeometric and find it that way. Uh, graphing calculators don't have a hypergeometric. Um, so hypergeometric, the conditions. So remember we did the binomial. So in this case, it's also going to be we're taking two samples. or say, Sorry, we're taking a sample from two groups. In this case, it was male or female. Um, you're concerned with the group of interest, which the book calls it the first group. It doesn't matter what you call it. The group of interest that we had, we wanted to find the likelihood of having two males. So males was my group of interest. Uh, and then the sampling is done without replacement. Since it's without replacement, the probability changes every step. So again, binomial, probability stays the same. Geometric, probability stays the same. Hypergeometric, probability changes because we do it without replacement. So in discerning which one are we doing, that's another process. You know, like, how do I know which one is which? That's another way of doing it. Okay, and that's how you would denote a hypergeometric. X follows a hypergeometric distribution. R, B, and N. R is the size of the subset of interest. B is the size of the other group. So in this case, it would have been males. We had three. Females, we had four. And N was three because that was our sample size. All right. And then if you had to find the mean... The expected number of males in a given group, that's how you would do it. It's a pretty short formula, but just remember what all the letters mean. And then the last one for today is the Poisson. That's the likelihood of an event on a fixed interval. And the notation is a distribution of X follows a Poisson distribution with an average. This one's a little bit different. Here's how you actually find to calculate the probability of it. This lambda is the modified mu. And I'll show you what I mean by that when we get there. And x is the looking at how many I'm looking for. So it's going to be this lambda or this mu to the x power over x factorial times e. E, right? Euler's constant, the transcendental number e to the negative lambda. Unique characteristic of the Poisson is that the variance of the Poisson and the expected value are the same number. The variance is the standard deviation squared. So sigma squared of a Poisson is equal to the expected value. But here's what it would look like. Uh, if fabric is known to have an average of two stitching flaws per square yard of material, what's the probability of flag made with this material? Which is 12 feet by 8 feet, 18 feet. 
has more than 45, for, uh, my English is terrible in that question. What is the probability that a flag made with this material, which is, the flag is 12 feet by 18 feet, has more than 45 flaws? So there's the scenario. You're imagining this. First thing first, we need to change units. So 12 feet by 18 feet, you're thinking this, but it talks about yards versus feet. There's three feet in a yard, which means this is four yards by six yards. So this is 12 yards of material. If there's 12 yards of material, then I would expect there to be Uh, 24, wait, this isn't 12, this is 24. Come on, check my multiplying while I go through here. I get going on showing, showing the example and I lose track of like simple math. Six times four is 24. And that means my lambda, my modified mu, that's what I mean by modified mu. The mu is two stitches per yard. I've got 24 yards, which means I have an expected number of Flaws to be 48 because there's two per yard. All right, so Poisson follows on any given interval. So here I'm talking an area interval versus maybe an uh, interval of time and things like that, like how often a bus is late in a given hour. Those are the other types of ways this could be a Poisson type distribution. So if that's the case, first things first is do your quick conversion, set up your problem, find your lambda, which is your modified mu. Given the mu of two stitches error per yard, well, now there's 24 yards, so my new lambda is my new expected. I expect there to be 48 flaws. Then the process would be like this, right? The formula, like, all right, so this is the probability of there being 45 flaws. 48 to the 45, or 45 factorial times e to the negative 48. Eh, it's a lot of calculating. Then you do it for 46, and then 47, and then 48, and then 49, and then 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, and you keep on going because you could have a lot of flaws in this particular area, which again, like in the olden days, right, we would take and we'd find 0 to 44 flaws. We would find flaws from x is 0 up to 48, not 48, 44. If we'd find that probability from 0 to 44 flaws, then we take 1 minus that probability, that would give me 45 and more. Because I'll either have 45 and more flaws, or I'll have fewer than 45 flaws. Still fairly labor-intensive, where we tend to rely on technology. I mean, the other way to do it is I could find, but the, again, technology. That would be what the website looks like. This is one possible Poisson distribution calculator where I would indicate right here, I have X is 45. My mu, how many I expect there to be, that's 48. Now here they say mu. In our problem, it was 48. That was my lambda. That's only because this doesn't know that it wasn't originally this particular case. So then here I have the probability that x is 45, so once I hit this and hit calculate, it changes that. So the likelihood of having exactly 45 flaws is only 5%. Having fewer than 45 flaws is 31%. More, less than or equal to 45, greater than 45, 45 and more. That would be my actual answer that I'd be looking for, because I'm looking for at least 45 flaws, which is point. 68689. Technology for the hypergeometric, technology for the Poisson. Most of the time, because of how much time we're going to be have limited to what we're doing in assessments, is you're going to need to know how to calculate it. Or first off, is this a Poisson? Is this hypergeometric? Is this geometric or is this binomial? And be able to provide reasons for that from what you understand, just like we did when we compared our distributions at the beginning of this lecture. Two, writing down the right formulas with the right numbers in it. 
And then pretty much at that point, for especially hypergeometric and Poisson, you just kind of leave it at that because we're not going to have the technology tools to run through all these calculations during an exam. All right, there will be other assignments where we do it. Obviously, the problems that you're doing out of your book, you're doing it. Um, but, but for what we're going to use for the class, uh, we will not do that during an exam for the Poisson and the hypergeometric. As always, don't forget, look at all that stuff that's already happened. Ta-da. Here we are. Coming up on Wednesday, February 7th. So this is when, like when you come to class on Wednesday and I have you working back on the windows again. Those are the tasks that we're doing during those times. So if you're missing classes because you're gone for a school-sponsored activity, make sure you send me those emails the day of so I can mark you down as excused so you don't lose credit for being here and doing those problems. Ta-da!